the sermon. Let's pray. Father God, we, we do want to ask for your presence. I ask for your infilling of your spirit to guide me, and I pray, Lord, that you would bless us and challenge us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. I couldn't think of a really good um, opening introductory uh, story for this particular topic this morning, so uh, I, I, I just, the wit wasn't there. I, I couldn't connect the dots with a really good story about Reveal. I thought about uh, Christmas and opening up packages, and I thought, yeah, that's kind of lame. And I thought about, uh, you know, um, what's, my, what's the uh, TV game show about the price, and you got to select what's behind this curtain and that curtain. Yeah, those are kind of, price is right, yeah, kind of lame. So I really don't have a good story to connect this to, so sorry about that. So our text this morning was Amos 3.7, and this has come up in my study recently. And of course, the word reveal is in here, and that's where I titled the sermon. It says, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. So God is not a God who goes around doing stuff without giving us forewarning, without revealing his intentions and his plans. Now I will tell you that when he reveals, he doesn't always do it in such a way that it's easy to figure out. In fact, many times he reveals in such a way that there's some effort involved in trying to figure out what is this all about? How do I understand this? I think part of that has to do with God, when he writes in scripture, he's trying to convey his message to many cultures over many periods of time, and you know, to speak to the 21st century mind would not make sense to a 10th century person. And so some of the message is somewhat broad-based and, and vague, I guess you could say, because he is dealing over culture and time. I think the other aspect of this, though, is that God expects us to put forth a little bit of effort in understanding. As humans, the mind of the human is not equivalent to the mind of God. Would you agree with that? God's ways are not our ways. His mind and his thoughts are far greater than our thoughts. So God has to somewhat condescend and come down, no different than when you see adults talking to children. When adults talk to children, they don't use the same tone of voice. They don't use the same words. So God is trying to convey and reveal to us in something that he is hoping we understand. And he's trying to get us to understand. But God is not a God who works in secrecy. He reveals his will and his design and his plan. And this is very significant. <clears throat> As Adventists, our movement has started because of prophecy. It was the prophecies of Daniel and by extension the prophecies of Revelation that formulated this church. <clears throat> and it has been a huge part of who we are as a people in studying prophecy. We don't always do a good job. We don't always agree. We sometimes wrestle because some of these prophecies aren't necessarily easy. And, of course, there are different schools of thought on prophetic interpretation, and so we argue about some of that. But I want to share a journey that I've been having for more than a year. And that started almost two years ago when I was, well, I guess I had been here about a year, and I really was kind of floating. And somebody asked me to teach a Sabbath school class. And I really honestly did not want to interfere with the classes that were going on. I didn't want to um, create a dynamic in which there was competition. And so I was a little reluctant, but somebody had come to me and said, would you teach a class on Daniel? And I said, sure. And so what we did was we went through the book of Daniel verse by verse. I had never done this before. I had studied much of Daniel but I got out my resources and I had done my reading and we went through verse by verse, much like Jerry does with the book of Romans, text by text, trying to understand it. And it was fairly straightforward. Uh, there were no surprises. It was, I mean, for some of the students, there were some things that came out. But for me, I, I didn't really have any um, 
huge lights go on, maybe in Revelation 11 and 12, which has been controversial in our history as far as the interpretation as to whether it's Islam or whether it's, you know, who the king of the north and who the king of the south and some of those things. But we went through it verse by verse and we finished the class and they said, would you do the same thing with Revelation? Whoa, Daniel was easy compared to this. I had never done a text by text, verse by verse study of Revelation. I had done sections of Revelation. I had done some of the prophecies. In fact, if you've ever been to an evangelistic series in Adventism, the primary chapters is Revelation 13, 14, 17, and 19 are the primary chapters that the majority of evangelistic sermons and prophetic sermons are preached on. But I had never gone through in depth, verse by verse, the book of Revelation. And I was a little intimidated by it, and I thought, well, okay, I'll try but that means I'm gonna to have to put a lot of work into this because I, I didn't have the necessary background. <clears throat> so, you know, we've all studied and had quarterlies on the book of Revelation. They're kind of broad-based. Uh, and I've studied passages to do Revelation as far as evangelistic preaching. But boy, this was gonna be a challenge. So I started looking for resources, and my two primary resources that I've used are Ranko Stefanovic, who wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation, and John Pauline. John Pauline was one of my seminary instructors. I took New Testament with him. I took Christ, uh, Christology with him. Um, and uh, John Pauline is a very deep thinker. Not the best person to listen to as far as speaking, because he is very dry and droll and hard to listen to, and I've, he put me to sleep more than once in his class, let's put it that way. But he always had really good content, and very deep thinking man. And so I've got his resources, and I got Ranko Stefanovic's resources, and I started to go through the book of Revelation step by step. So after about a year, maybe it's a little more than a year, we're only on Revelation 10 in our class, but I have been so blessed um, by this and so challenged and I have changed my perspective on so many things that I used to have in the book of Revelation because of this. Um, there is something unique and different when you do a verse by verse total study as opposed to taking little subsections and plucking them out. And I think Jerry, you'd agree that you get a, a greater depth doing that than just pulling out a text and trying to, to uh, understand a deeper concept because when the author is writing something, there is a broad-based understanding that he's trying to gain, get across. So, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is to share some of the insights that I've learned. I am not going to repeat a verse-by-verse -verse study of Revelation with you, but I would like to start a sermon series where I share some of the things that I've learned in Revelation that I've shared with my class and I want to apologize because it'll be reviewed with my class. But I asked their permission this morning and they said, okay. I had to get permission for them to do this. I am, like I said, I am not going to go through a verse by verse with you. But that has informed me and I'm going to try to give you more of a synopsis or an overview. Maybe a, a, a what is the books that they put out now? The uh, Idiot's Guide to Revelation. Maybe that's, I don't know how you want to put it. So I want to start, and today I'm going to start, and I'm going to start fairly simply, and uh, hopefully some of this may be review, some of this you maybe already know, maybe some of this I will touch on points that you had no idea about. But today we're starting pretty simple with the book of Revelation. Now, I was looking through different Bibles, and I found out that there, the name for the book of Revelation is different. In fact, uh, there's like three or four different translations that say that this is the Apocalypse of St. John the Apostle. Now most of your books, most of the modern translations say the Revelation of John. But have you heard the word Apocalypse used in our society and in different contexts? The word Apocalypse. What is the general meaning in society of the word Apocalypse? Pardon? The end? A catastrophe? The apocalypse is coming. It's some, you know, there's, there's meteors or there's fire coming down from heaven. And so the term apocalypse has gained an understanding of a catastrophic end of world event that destroys everything. 
Yeah, well, that's not what it means at all. <clears throat> but again, popular culture kind of gives us meanings and takes things out of context. And, and so when we listen to that sort of stuff, it, it affects how we look at it. So when I say the book of Revelation, how many of you have fear and trepidation in your heart? Go ahead, be honest. I asked that of my class. And they were like, oh, this book scares the living snot out of me. But if you ask anybody from my class, they will find out that the fear quotient has gone down significantly based on knowledge and not superstition or misrepresentation. And hopefully, I can give you a sense of that this morning. The term apocalypse of St. John is, is it, it's not incorrect because the Greek word is used is apocalypse. But it's our understanding today of apocalypse that's kind of sent us off the wrong direction. So I want to deal with two issues of this title. First of all, what does apocalypse mean and who, is the really, who really is giving the message? Is it John or somebody else? So apocalypse is a transliteration of, the Greek, of a compound Greek word. The first is apo, which means away from, and kalupsis, which means veil or covering. So what does the word really mean? It means unveiling. It doesn't mean a catastrophic end time event. It is an unveiling or an un, a revealing. A revealing. What do we read in Amos 3, 7? God doesn't do anything unless he reveals it to his prophets. God won't do anything in the future unless he reveals it because he wants his people to know, not guess, not worry, not fear, not run in circles. The apocalypse is a revealing. It's like pulling back the curtain. It's an expose. It's not about a scary end time synopsis in which aliens show up and destroy the world. But you ever notice in those Hollywood movies how somebody always survives? They always survive. I, if it's the end of the world and everything's going to be destroyed, how can somebody survive? But Hollywood does whatever. So the word revealed or a revelation is probably a better translation of apocalypse. So we get the word revelation of John. It, the term denotes a disclosure of something previously hidden or a secret. So God doesn't necessarily give, keep secrets, but he doesn't reveal everything all at once because just like you don't reveal everything to your children, they're not capable of handling it. And the revelation of John and the revelation that takes place in this book was not intended for many people in the past. It's an, it is a futuristic from John. Much of revelation was going to deal with things that were going to happen in the future. Some of it was very relevant to John's time, and that that comes into interpretation that we're going to get into later. But the book of Revelation is God revealing. <clears throat> Something that was hidden in the past but is now being exposed. Why does God want to reveal or expose these things? Why would God want to do that? Does he love you? How many of you want to prepare your kids for when they get older and when they leave the house? And so you reveal to them certain things when it's age appropriate. You reveal to them things about finances or about human relationships or sexuality. But you don't do that with a four-year-old. You start revealing things as they get older and more mature. But God wants to prepare a people that he loves by revealing to them things that they're going to need to know. Now, we can turn a blind eye and we can say, well, I just don't want to know it. But God seems to feel that we have a need to know some of these things, hence the revealing. A apocalypse does not mean a catastrophic event. It, it means a revealing of a secret or something unknown or hidden or something that has been veiled. But the second part of the issue is, is this really the unveiling by the prophet John? Or is there something more? Who is it that's revealing this? And for me, this is one of the most important things in the interpretation of the book of Revelation. So, Revelation 1.1 answers the question of who this is that really is revealing. And it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place 
and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant John. Jesus communicated this to an angel who communicated it to John who wrote it down for our benefit. Who is the true author of the book of Revelation? Jesus is. That should take your fear down a little bit. If Jesus loves you, if he truly cares for you, if his grace abounds for you and he wants to give a message to you, don't you think it's important to listen? Does Jesus, is he in the business of scaring the bejeebers out of you? But just as a parent tries to prepare their children, doesn't he want to prepare you for what's soon to come? The book of Revelation is extremely significant. But it's one of the most understudied and probably one of the most difficult books in the Bible. And I will not deny that. The book of Revelation is hard. Sometimes we make it harder by the way we try to interpret it. But I want to try to give you, as we move forward, I want to give you some interpretive tools. I want to give you some um, uh, theories of interpretation that hopefully you can apply. But the tools that we've been going through and as we've been going through the book of Revelation, I can tell you in my class they have really sensed a lowering of anxiety because we are looking at the words of Jesus Christ. And I think that's exciting, that Jesus would care so much that he would want to send you a specific message, a message that you need in order to get through some difficult times ahead. I want to take the fear out of this book. The more I read, and the more I read it through the eyes of Jesus sending a message of warning to his children, the more I'm impressed that this book is important. So this is really a revelation of Jesus, not John. So it should be the revelation of Jesus Christ. I think the title more appropriate. That's kind of like the book, The Acts of the Apostles. That's, that's a wrong title for that book, too. What should it be called? The Acts of the Holy Spirit is probably a more accurate tra- uh, uh, name of that book. Just like this book should more accurately be re- the revealing by Jesus Christ. Now, John just reported what was given to him from the angel who had been given it from Jesus. So, yes, John is the author, and we have direct evidence that the apostle John, the one whom Jesus loved the most, the the longest living of the apostles was the writer of this gospel. And he wrote it sometime between A.D. 90 and 100. It was the last book that was written by the first century church. It was also the last book that was put into the Bible because there was much controversy over this book as to whether it should be in there or not. It took a century after the writing, sometime in the early 200s, before they finally accepted that the book of Revelation was a revelation from Jesus Christ and should be included in the Bible. So this book is not without controversy in the history of the church. In fact, Martin Luther said it shouldn't even be in the Bible. It's, it's terrible. Just get rid of it. He was good at that. He wanted to get rid of several books. He wanted to get rid of James, Hebrews, Revelation. You know, we don't need that stuff. But if Jesus is giving us this message, I think that there should be a, at least the sensitivity that he wants us to know something. Now, the phrase in this, from the original Greek, of Jesus Christ can be interpreted two ways, either as subjective or objective genitive. Now, I hated this when I was in school, too parsing sentences and trying to figure out what's a subject, what's an object. Let me explain it to you. All right, this means Christ is the one who is doing the revealing. The revelation of Jesus is the revealing of Jesus of a message. Or it can be translated that Christ is the one who is revealed. The Greek allows for both. It could be an either or. So which is more correct? Whoa, what just happened? Did I do that? This thing's dangerous. Here, you want to hold it for me? I just made that thing go. Oh, this is the pregnant pause. Which is more correct? The gospel from Jesus, that he's the one who's reporting it, or the gospel about Jesus? Which is more accurate? Which is more 
correct to the language? Yes, both. It's not either or, it's both. Boy, I thought I had both bigger. It actually ended up being smaller. What did I do wrong there? So this is a revelation from Jesus about Jesus. Why would we be afraid to read something like that? Why would you fear reading a direct letter from Jesus about himself and what he is doing and what he wants to do? I'm wondering, because this book has become so hands-off, don't touch it, I don't want to just, it, it's scary. Is Jesus trying to scare us? I don't think he is, but he's trying to warn us. He's trying to give us a revealing of, of information we need to know. How would you like to go into a classroom that you had never studied on a topic and take the test? Think about that. Some of you are breaking into a sweat right now thinking about taking a test. But now think about taking a test in a subject matter that you've never had any studying, no reading, no information, no lecture, nothing. And you're walking in and you have to take the test. Jesus said, I'm going to give you the crib notes. You don't have to take the test without knowing what's coming. It's an open book test too, you know that. <clears throat> we shouldn't fear the book of Revelation because it comes from Jesus and it is about Jesus. This book should be loved and studied by those who love Jesus. Now I know we don't send letters anymore. We send uh, these little texts or tweets that are what 120 characters and you can't say much but think about the soldier who get, got a letter from his wife when he was in the battlefield how did he respond to that letter with anticipation with excitement with this desire to and and I think I told this story before I was in the Navy and I hadn't written home or called home in almost two years and uh, my mother called my commanding officer to complain and I got called into the commanding officer's uh, stateroom, and he said, son, call your mommy. That was pretty embarrassing. Do you think my mother wanted to hear from me? Do you think she wanted a letter or something, some sort of communication? Here Jesus is sending a letter to us, and he's saying, I love you, and I want you to understand what's happening. Yeah, that was pretty embarrassing. I did call my mom, though. Then I said, mom, don't ever call the captain again. It's just not right. <laughs> So Jesus is the one who's being revealed to us as the one who loves us and he wants us to understand something. This is a revealing, he's, it's like he's opening his heart to us. Why should we fear something like that? And it, it, maybe you don't fear the book of Revelation. Maybe you just don't understand the book of Revelation and you just don't care. You know, it's too hard. Well, from somebody like Jesus, maybe we should put forth the effort to try to understand it. To, to dig a little deeper. So without understanding that Jesus is the author and he is the subject of the book, it can be difficult. And maybe people, if, if they got that picture, would be less reluctant to, to try to study. It does require some effort, though. I will tell you, it will require some effort on your part. And maybe that's what we don't want to do is put the time in. But... You know, I've been spending, and I'm not suggesting you do this, but I've been spending six to eight hours a week studying just four or five verses, trying to get the deepest understanding I can to present it to my Sabbath school class. There's a lot of com commentaries. There's a lot of things, and, and putting it all together, what makes the most sense, what, what flows the best. And the other thing that happens here, like I said, is when you put it in the context of the whole book, it becomes, it makes more sense. So for instance, you understand that the book, the book of Revelation uses the number seven almost 52 times. Seven is a significant number in the book of Revelation. There's, there's reasons for that. You're familiar with the primary sevens, the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven last plagues. And so you've kind of looked at those maybe independently. Maybe you've heard a sermon. I bet you as Adventists, you've heard a sermon on the seventh church, the church of Laodicea. But have you looked at it in the context of all the seven churches? 
And have you ever laid them side by side and compared the seven churches to the seven seals and the seven trumpets? And when you start doing some of these things, suddenly patterns start to show up. And there's some really, really interesting things that you start to see as you lay them side by side. That's the kind of in-depth study that needs to take place so that you understand the comprehensive message instead of taking one small story or one, two or three verses and trying to dig out, and, and I'm not saying that's inappropriate, but I'm saying that sometimes you miss the larger context and you can make it scary. The seven trumpets, for instance, we just finished with those. Most of the people in my class really, really were nervous about the seven trumpets. Do you know the seven trumpets is not about the people of God? It has no context with God's people whatsoever. The seven trumpets are in connection with the wicked, the lost. But people are looking at the seven trumpets thinking, God is going to get me. If you love Jesus, it has nothing to do with you. Other than to give you information of how God functions and how God is dealing with the sin problem. But if you don't put that together with the, with the now the seven churches, that's dealing specifically with God's people. Seven trumpets, dealing with some, a whole different category of people. And these are some of the things that I have started to integrate and put together and, and make bigger sense out of the book of Revelation than I had in the past. Without the foundation of Jesus Christ, or with the foundation of Jesus Christ, we can take hope and comfort in both the message and the messenger. And my approach and my, the way that we have been studying this book, I, I really believe has been comprehensive and it has been Christ-centered. We have been looking for Jesus Christ throughout the book. Amos 3, 7, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. As a prophetic movement, as a, a movement that God has ordained, based on prophecy, we, as Adventists, should be the foremost in wanting to study and understand this book. So what I'm going to do over the next few weeks, and again, I don't know how long this is going to last, is I'm going to try to give you some of the insights that I've been learning and trying to, to connect you with the book of Revelation to take away some of the fear, the anxiety, and the ignorance involved. And I will admit that I had some very strong um, ignorance on some of the issues in the book of Revelation before I started this, this journey. Now, we're not done, and I'm still working on it. I think I'm up through chapter 11 right now as far as my own personal studies. Um, and the other thing I want to say to you, the first half, the first 11 chapters of the book of Revelation tend to be historical, dealing with the uh, first century to the end of time. When you get into Revelation 12, which is, I'm going to explain this later, if you know anything about chiasms, chiasm is a Hebrew way of thinking and writing where it's sort of parallelism. It's, it's more like a triangle so that the thought goes like this and then it comes back like this and there's parallels and I'll explain that and I'll put a graph up there. But the center of the book of Revelation, the focal point of the chiasm, chiasm is Revelation 12. Do you know what's in Revelation 12? What do we get from that chapter? The great controversy. It is the focal point of the whole book. So... Revelation 1 to 11 kind of gives you build up, then it gives you the great controversy as a central theme, and Revelation 13 on gives you the last day events, which happen at the very end of Earth's time. Revelation 13 on is, is very much relevant to us because my theology says that we're living in that time. It is more relevant to this generation than it ever has been in the previous 20 generations. So this is why I have such a passion about this book. And, and I will tell you, I had some misperceptions and, and wrong ideas, and maybe they're still wrong, but have changed in my position on a number of things that I had heard preached, I had preached. And by going through this in detail, I've come to some different conclusions. And maybe you will too, or maybe you will be challenged to challenge me, and that's okay. I think it's a book that we can argue about and discuss and try to wrestle with. 
I don't know. In, in fact, I have a chart that I, I printed out for my class today about all the Adventist scholars and their interpretation of the seven trumpets. And there's nine different primary ways to look at the seven trumpets. And it's interesting, if you go down that chart, to see people like Uriah Smith, William Shea, um, 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 Irvin, or Maxwell, uh, and, and the different ways that they interpret it. And, and it's interesting that we're able to still talk to each other sometimes, but there's a lot of parallels too. There's a lot of things they agree on and there's some things they disagree on. But if with your permission, I would like to do this over the next however many sermons. I don't know, maybe I'll preach this until I die. <clears throat> you better hope not. <clears throat> <laughs> unless you'd be praying for my death sooner <laughs> and maybe I can get Trish to give me a, a heart surgery or something so. so with that this is kind of an introductory sermon to where I want to go that's all I have for today and um, thanks <laughs>